folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the second of our double bill today. And we're, we're calling this part of our Aviation the Pacific Week, but technically it's actually about the organization of the, the development of the atomic bomb that mostly occurred within continental USA. But it's part of the same broad theme. So if you didn't see this morning's show or the late evening show, depending on where you were in the world, it was a doozy. And it is, has become my most commented on show ever. I mean, literally dozens of comments, some very long, some short, some have had their opinion changed. If you didn't see it, it was Paul Ham, the Australian pre uh, historian, presenting his argument that the dropping of atomic bombs was basically unnecessary. Now, whether you agree with it or don't agree with it, that was all uh, down to you to watch it and make your own um, opinion and decision. But it was a great discussion, and I thank you for taking it on board with the spirit that was intended, which was for healthy to debate. But today or now we're going to discuss, I say, the Manhattan Project. Dr. Kit Chapman has been on a few shows before. We talked about the science behind the bombs earlier. We've talked about weird and wacky animals in World War II. That was fairly recent. But today we're going to look at the organization of the Manhattan Project. And if you are new to World War II TV, perhaps you found us because of the earlier show. Well, thank you. We do a whole variety of shows uh, on this channel some about the tech, some about the people, some about the battles. You're very welcome here. Just, I always say, leave us comments, even if they're not very positive. Uh, share with what we're doing with your friends. Uh, um, subs click to subscribe and click the little bell so you get notifications. And all the information you need is in the, the description on YouTube. So links to my authors uh, and guests' websites, their books, their projects, their social media handles, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to bring in Dr. Chapman now. So good evening, Kit. How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me back. Well, it seems it's not been very long, as it was only a couple of weeks ago. So the Manhattan Ooh. Project, it's just enormous, isn't it? I mean, that's the thing is, uh, we, were, we were just talking before going live there that how they're going to treat it in the forthcoming movie with Killian Murphy. And will it be the kind of imitation game, the Enigma Bletchley of like three guys in a shed with a chalkboard and a, and a calculator going, Eureka, we've done cracked the atomic fusion. Or will it actually explain the huge complexity of this organization that spanned numerous States and numerous areas, but we'll see with it with regards to the movie. But, um, your interest, you're, you're a scientist, journalist, teacher, but you love the history. So when did the Manhattan Project kind of first come up on your radar as, as you, Kit Chapman? So my, my PhD is actually in creating elements that don't exist on Earth. And I got into that right at the end of them. It's called the super heavy elements. We discovered a bunch of them uh, a couple of years ago and um, predominantly in Russia. It's actually a, a joint Russian, or it was before the Ukrainian war, a joint Russian-US project. And if you go back to the start of that, the first elements that don't exist on Earth, the first elements that are created are right at the prelude of the Manhattan Project. And of course, the key one is plutonium. That doesn't exist on Earth. And the guy who discovers plutonium, Glenn Seaborg, I became essentially his biographer. Uh, and so I started learning about the Manhattan Project around element discovery and just built up my knowledge from there. Well, that was a nice, succinct answer to that. And to say the number of people involved in this, there are the household names and, and people have already started asking about, you know, uh, um, FDR's decision to use it. Would he have been made the same decision as Truman? We're already getting the debates about the use of the weapon. But really, although maybe we can we can have your opinion on that later on, it is really about the organization behind it and the the the, the, the the process of deciding whether or not to use it is kind of beyond the scope of today's show. But um, there are some household names in this. And, you know, you've only got to throw Einstein and Oppenheim and others involved peripherally or centrally to this. But it was massive, as we'll find out. So I'll, I'll load up your PowerPoint and then you can take us through. And folks, we'll do questions kind of as we go along. But as I say, we'll try and tick, keep them to the organization rather than the moral use. And the re otherwise, we'll just go down a rabbit hole that will be never ending and meandering. <laughs> That is the problem with the Manhattan Project. There are so many rabbit holes you can go down because this is huge and it's almost impossible to give it a single one hour talk. So I'm just going to focus predominantly on the organization to give you an idea of the sheer scale of the Manhattan Project. Because believe me, even if you've studied the Manhattan Project, you don't necessarily appreciate just how vast it was and the prelude to it. But thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm Dr. Kit Chapman and I'm not going to talk too much about the long prelude to the bomb, 
Um, but you kind of need to understand some of the science and what was happening to understand why the Manhattan Project came about. So these are three of the many figures that we could discuss during the 1930s. We could do the British, James Chadwick discovering the neutron. We could do the French, the Julio Curies, Irene and, and Frederick. Uh, that's um, Marie Curie's daughter and, uh, and son-in-law. But we're just gonna focus on these three people. Uh, on the left, we've got Enrico Fermi. Uh, I would argue the greatest physicist of the 20th century, fascinating character, uh, Nobel Prize winner, um, Italian, and this is kind of important. Many of the people who are working on the Manhattan Project were from Axis nations, and you'll see why they just kind of get driven away. Enrico Fermi, his wife was Jewish. Uh, in the middle, middle there, we have Leo Szilard, and uh, Szilard was a fascinating character. He was part of what we call the Martians, a group that came over from Hungary, uh, included things like Edward Teller, uh, sorry, people like Edward Teller and uh, John von Neumann, all of whom uh, contributed to the Manhattan Project. And Szilard is the guy that in the 1930s comes up with this idea, what if we could make a series of atoms explode, one after the other after the other in a chain reaction? What kind of thing would happen? The answer, of course, is you get a very, very big boom. And finally there, we've got Lise Meitner. And Meitner is the physicist who discovers that you can make atoms explode. She was Austrian and she was Jewish. She was forced to flee Germany. She was working at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and she flees to Sweden. Now, all of these three characters are from Axis nations. As we mentioned, mm -hmm. it's Italy, Hungary and, uh, and Austria. But of course, they all end up contributing to the Allied side of the war effort. Now, Atoms make up our world. I'm going to give you the very basic science of what's going on because you kind of need to understand it when we're looking at the Manhattan Project, particularly nuclear stuff. So this is a helium atom and it is one angstrom. That bar at the bottom there, that black bar, is one angstrom wide, which is about a billion times smaller than the palm of your hand. It is 10 to the minus 10 meters, that whole sort of bar. And you can see an atom is roughly one angstrom. But the key bit of the atom, almost 99% of its mass, and the really important bit, is that tiny dot in the middle. That is one femtometer, 10 to the minus 15 meters small, and that is the nucleus. And you see we've got some red dots in there, we've got some blue dots. They're not red and blue in real life. The red dots represent protons and the blue neutrons. Now protons decide what element you've got. If you have one proton, it's, he it's hydrogen, two is helium, three lithium, all the way up to 92 protons, that's uranium. But the problem is protons are positively charged. And if you've ever tried to push positive magnets together, it doesn't like it very much. They wanna break apart. So you need to have packing filler in there. And you've got these blue little neutrons and the neutrons are the packing filler. They have no charge whatsoever. They keep the nucleus together. Of course, when you get bigger and bigger atoms, you get to uranium, for example, there's so many protons in there that it becomes very, very unstable. It wants to break apart. It wants to release energy, and that's radiation. So that's what's going on with the atoms. Now, two things you need to know about atoms. They can join together or they can blow apart, and that's called fusion and fission. And you can blame Lise Meitner for having the names very, very similar. She came up with the term fission. Now, nuclear fusion is kind of interesting. So normally the Coulomb barrier, which is this positive, positive charge, as I mentioned, it prevents atoms from smashing apart, joining together. Things just don't bloom together in our world. You need a lot of pressure and heat and things going fast. And of course, you get that in the center of stars. So in stars, you've got nuclear fusion going on all the time. That's why the sun is so bright and brilliant. And nuclear fusion is really important because that builds our world uh, together. In the Big Bang, we only had hydrogen, a little bit of helium, a little bit of lithium. Anything heavier than that has been created in stars. So if you look around, you're looking at matter, you're looking at atoms making things up. Almost all of everything you see there has been made in stars, including yourself. You are star stuff, as Carl Sagan used to say. And I'm really that... cool. Thank you. I'm feeling very, yeah. And, and, and I just wanted to make my joke. I made it on the sidebar, I'm going to make it out loud, is this atom being very small, it's nearly as small as the difference between hot and cold on hotel showers. It's nearly that small, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
<laughs> it's tiny. I mean, when you think about shrinking things a billion, you know, a billion times, uh, if you took the moon and you reduced the moon a billion times, it would be the size of a, a football, a soccer ball. So when I say a billion times smaller than the palm of your hand, we are talking very, very small. Yeah. Now, this is nuclear fusion. It's important. And in the 1930s, Enrico Fermi thought that he was able to do that. He uh, started smashing some neutrons into an atom, and he thought he had what's called neutron capture. The neutron sticks in there and through various processes I'm not going to go into, turns into a proton. And that's really important for heavier elements, because if that's happening, if you turn uranium into a, a, you add a neutron to it and you turn it into a, um, a proton, you're moving one place up the periodic table. It's become 93 protons. That's something that doesn't exist on Earth. And he won the Nobel Prize for this in 1938. The problem is that that isn't what he was doing. He was making a mistake. It was a very fortunate mistake for him because, as I mentioned, his wife was Jewish. Uh, he was uh, his, wanted to get away from Italy because Benito Mussolini didn't like Jews. They started persecuting them. And he was able to say to, to you know, Benito, I'm just going to go after Sweden. I'm going to collect my Nobel Prize. I promise I will be right back. And of course, he and his family did a runner and went straight to America. But that wasn't what was happening. And in December 1938, a month after he gets the Nobel Prize, we find out because Lies Meitner is able to explain it. Uh, what's happening is a neutron is going into that uranium and it's forming an unstable nucleus. You can see it's going like a, a little sort of dumbbell kind of shape. Now, rather than sort of relaxing and turning into a proton and becoming stable, that does happen, but it's incredibly rare. It happens in, you know, one in a million times. More commonly, it, you get fission. It's too unstable, it breaks apart, and it breaks apart into much lighter elements. So it smashes up. Here we've got krypton and barium and lots and lots of energy. Now, the equation that I've mentioned before uh, in other shows is E equals mc squared. That is energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Now, the mass of a single atom blowing apart is tiny. Of course, it's ridiculous. We, we've seen how small it is. But the speed of light squared is huge. And so when you add that up, you're releasing an awful lot of energy. And this is where Szilard's idea comes in, because you see those little neutrons flying off. You've got three of them there, as well as your, your krypton and your barium. They're going to strike other atoms. And those atoms are going to break apart and they're going to release neutrons and energy. And if you keep doing that, you get the chain reaction and you manage to get a bomb. So, so that... just, to, just to clarify things, Kit, because yeah, sure. for my own head and maybe for the viewers. No, no, please, well, please. But this work being done in, 30, in the 30s, mm -hmm. is it primarily because they're just scientists? They're trying to investigate how stuff works and how the universe around us, what makes it up? Or are they already thinking about an application for this that can that can lead us to the way of atomic bombs? What What's the driving force between the study of this? The study of it is purely theoretical. Um, okay. Enrico Fermi was working, um, he was working at a place called the Via Panis Perna in the center of Rome. It's now actually their Ministry of the Interior, where his lab was. He was in a villa and he didn't have any fancy equipment. Uh, he didn't have the, the, the things that the Joliot Curies did because they were Marie Curies, you know, um, daughter and, uh, and son-in-law. Um, so he was just having to think outside the box. And he wrote a paper uh, and sent it off to nature and said, I've come up with this brilliant idea. I think there's a kind of a baby neutron. I'm going to call it the neutrino, which, of course, in Italy, I think Eno is, is baby. And nature laughed him out of the office. They said, this is stupid. Don't be, don't be ridiculous. Neutrinos couldn't possibly exist. Now, of course, we know later on he's right. But because he was he was so angry about not being able to get that paper published. He decided, you know what? I'm just going to start messing around with elements, fire neutrons into them, see what happens. Who knows? Uh, he was doing it in a fish pond at one point um, to try and slow down his neutrons with water. And it's this, you know, really basic kind of equipment setup that wins the Nobel Prize and furthers knowledge. And at that point, everyone knows what Fermi's doing. But no one believes that fission exists. Uh, only one person, a woman called Ida Nodak, even suggested this could be the case. And of course, what happens in Germany, uh, it's actually a guy called Otto Hahn who's doing it. And he's trying the experiment just to see if he can do what Fermi did. And he's saying, he's actually a really good chemist. And he goes, well, no, Fermi's wrong. I've got krypton and barium. How's that even possible? He writes his letter to Lise Miner asking her, you know, 
I've got these results. I have no idea what's happening. And Meitner and uh, and her nephew, uh, a guy called Frisch, um, say actually sort of come up with this whole idea of fission. So at the moment, it's really theoretical. But at the mo the moment this happens, the moment everyone realizes you can make an atom explode, everyone realizes the potential consequences. And in fact, uh, the Wehrmacht, the Wehrmacht, sorry, uh, they start looking into whether or not they should be using this as a weapon. Um, the invasion of Poland convinces them otherwise. They think actually we can just do it with conventional troops. But the yeah. moment this happens, this is when everything starts to accelerate. And that actually leads us to the next point. Um, the August 1939 Einstein Szilard letter. So Albert Einstein, obviously the most famous scientist of the 20th century. I think everyone's heard about Albert Einstein. And uh, Leo Szilard is really, really worried about the use of the potential bombs. Now he knows he hasn't got the impact himself to write a letter and anyone to listen. But if Albert Einstein writes the letter, everyone is gonna listen. And so he convinces Einstein to write to President Roosevelt to say, look, the Germans are gonna be looking into this. And so that's how we start developing the nuclear weapons. Okay. So if I move on to the letter, because actually we have it here. Um, sorry, uh, normally you, you I, I, for some reason I haven't got the, the slide skipping. Uh, behind him, you've got the letter and in the front, you've got the response from Roosevelt. And you can see October, 1990, uh, October 19th, 1939, Franklin Roosevelt is reading the, a letter from Einstein that says, you know, that it is it's conceivable that a bomb may be used. This is something the Germans are already looking at. We need to start focusing on it. The United States hasn't got very good uranium. You need to start looking at it from the Belgian Congo. Einstein's telling him what to do. And Roosevelt immediately authorizes it. He sets up a committee to start looking at the feasibility of using uranium as a bomb. Because if the Americans can understand it and if the Americans have got it, obviously they can counter what the Germans have got. And so it's kind of interesting that in 1939, this is, you know, war has been declared, obviously, uh, in Europe, but the Americans aren't involved. They are involved. already looking at nuclear weapons. Okay. And everybody was doing this. Um, the Germans looked at it. The British looked at it. The British were actually quite in the lead for, for a long, long time. The Japanese had two nuclear bomb projects. But this ends the participation of Albert Einstein. So Albert Einstein was an ardent pacifist. Also, bear in mind, he was technically an enemy alien. He was from Germany. And so he couldn't get involved too much with things, but he didn't want anything to do with the Manhattan Project. And so there is often a uh, sort of a misconception of him being heavily involved in the Manhattan Project. He wasn't. Um, later on, he said he regretted writing the letter at all. Um, but that kicks off the American looking into the, Americans looking into the weapon. And the first thing we get is called the Advisory Committee on Uranium. This is from 1939 to about mid-1940s. Um, June 1940, the National Defense Research Committee is formed under this chap. This is Vannevar Bush. Um, the best way to think of Vannevar Bush, he is an incredibly influential figure that many people probably haven't heard of. He is essentially the American scientific advisor to the president, even though that wasn't ever his official title. And he's running this, he's funding for, for looking into uranium, whether or not it's feasible to make a bomb out of it, is 6,000 US dollars. That's in 1940s money. Now he pushes on the investigations and then in June 1940, the National Defense Research Committee is formed. And I won't go into the various sort of structures of how the, the US work things, but the National Defense Research Committee then gets taken over by um, Conant, um, who is the president of Harvard, Vannevar Bush moves up and he becomes uh, in charge of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. That's uh, Conant there. But Vannevar Bush keeps this as directly reporting into him. And in June 1940, they move on the research. We're now at around about a million dollars worth of funding. And they are focused heavily on this from June 1940 onwards. Uh, so we've, we've got what's called the Uranium Committee, also known as S1 section. Now, two things happen that sort of convince them that they really need to look at it even more. The first is in September 1940, the Tizard mission. This was a mission from the British to try and trade scientific secrets, scientific knowledge with the, with the Americans for support and materiel. 
And one of the things they come up with is what they've been finding on their own uh, project, which is called the MAUD Committee. And they've already determined that a nuclear bomb is completely feasible. Uh, what actually happened was a guy called Mark Oliphant. He was an Australian. Um, he was uh, trying to find some work uh, for two of his uh, associates who were in the country. They were supporting the Allied effort, but they were both enemy aliens. And so they weren't allowed to know anything really, really secret. Um, this was uh, Frisch and, uh, and Pirils. And he says, well, why don't you just go and look and see if we can make this atom bomb thing? You know, is this feasible? And they come back immediately and say, it's completely feasible. We've done all the maths. This is going to be a very powerful potential weapon. And so the British report this and the US reaction isn't, oh my goodness, we never knew that this was a, a possibility. We never knew that atomic bombs could exist. They were, we are way behind the British. We need to speed up and catch up. And in fact, Oliphant himself goes over to the United States and he convinces them, he speaks to the committee and says, you really need to push in and invest into this. So this is another stage of the prelude before the Manhattan Project. And of course, I mentioned that June 1940 to December 1941. Well, we all know what happens in December 1941 for the Americans and World War II. But actually, the day before is when the project gets accelerated. It is the 6th of December 1941. Uh, the committee meets. They're having lunch. And they start divvying up money to really invest in this. Now, the photo next to you, that is the, uh, the S1 committee. And there are some extraordinary pit figures on there. On the far left, you've got, uh, you've got Yuri, who was a Nobel Prize winner. Um, on the far right, you've got Arthur Compton, another Nobel Prize winner, uh, incredibly influential figure. Now, he takes um, 340,000 US dollars uh, to look into uh, research at Columbia and Princeton universities. Um, in, uh, in, U in uh, New York and uh, in New Jersey. He also takes $278,000 for a lab in Chicago. Now that uh, we'll come back to because that's quite important. 500,000 US dollars is given for raw materials to obtain uranium so they can actually start this bomb making process to start refining the uranium. The problem they've got is that the fissile isotope, the isotope of uranium that releases all the, the neutrons and allows you to have that chain reaction, is uranium-235. You don't get that naturally in large quantities. And so you actually have to change the isotope, the number of neutrons of the uranium to make an effective weapon. The other interesting thing is Lawrence. So Lawrence is being given 400,000 for this separation pro pro um, process. And Ernest Lawrence is the guy in the white shirt with the black tie next to Yuri. He's uh, second from the left. And Ernest Lawrence was the head of the radiation laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, just outside San Francisco. And he knew something that, uh, that no one in the world outside of the US knew. And he reported on it at this committee. And that is that you can make elements heavier than uranium. We mentioned this process of sort of nudging up the periodic table. If you nudge one proton up, you get Neptunium. If you nudge two up, you get Plutonium. And that, of course, becomes a very viable weapon. That had already been discovered at the University of California, Berkeley. They'd already begun to work on whether or not they could make a fissile isotope of it. And the answer was they absolutely could. So the aim is to get an atomic bomb by January 1945 they already know that they are in it for several years before they can get a bomb even feasible. And this is before the Manhattan Project starts. So if we move on, as I mentioned, meanwhile at Berkeley, in 1939, Edwin McMillan discovers this element 93, Neptunium, that you can do this. Um, he is immediately convinced otherwise um, by uh, Emilia Sigre, who is an Italian Jewish scientist who was, who was actually trained under Fermi. He, he fled to the United States and he had discovered an element previously. And he's saying to Macmillan, you haven't got an element. Don't worry about it. Um, Macmillan isn't convinced. He waits for a mate called Phil Adelson to come over in 1940 and they discover element 93 again. But he's asked to go and work on radar. And so he has to hand the project over and he gives it to a 28 year old um, scientist called Glenn Seaborg. And it's Glenn Seaborg and his team in a tiny attic space. Um, it's in Gilman Hall in, in Berkeley. Third floor, it's, it's, it's a tiny, tiny room. 
And apparently it absolutely stank because of what they were doing. There, they are able to isolate plutonium. And they're doing this, creating one atom at a time of plutonium because they've got to bombard it in, in a machine. Uh, what we've got there is called a cyclotron. It's basically a, a particle accelerator that spins things around in a circle rather than going in a straight line. And this was the brainchild of Ernest Lawrence. This is why Ernest Lawrence had won the Nobel Prize. So that's the tool they're using to make plutonium. But if they're making it one atom at a time, there is no way that they would ever be able to make enough of it to create a bomb. And so that creates two problems with the Manhattan Project. One is uranium. They can get loads and loads of uranium. You can mine it out of the ground. No one gives a monkeys about it. It's not considered that important. But of course, if you can refine it and you can get the right isotope, you can make a uranium bomb. Plutonium, it doesn't exist on Earth. Somehow they have to scale up a billion times. They have to really kind of mass produce it. And again, as I said, scaling up a billion times, if you take a soccer ball, a football, and you blow it up a billion times, it's the size of the moon. So they have two huge, very, very different uh, challenges with the Manhattan Project. Okay, so so when they're making the ball, they're, they're setting about this process to make plutonium. Mm -hmm. When you said there, this will this will lead to having the nuclear bomb. Is this still in theory though, or they know it'll work? They because it's still, if I'm correct, if I'm following this, it's still people just pointing to things they've worked out on paper. They don't. Pretty there's much. A, there's a theoretical, <laughs> theoretical end here, but it, until they actually start playing around with this stuff, it is only just, it's just, it's not a pipe dream, ex dream exactly, but it's not, you know, with, with, with flight, we've got aircraft that have already been flying. So we say, well, we know they fly. Now here's one that can go faster, more greater. Rate. This is still very much in the theoretical stage. Am I, am yeah, I wrong? I, I would liken it in, in sort of the stage of kind of like, you know, magnetic levitation trains in that we know we've, we, we, know we know it works. We know theoretically it works, but there is no way that we know how to build one of those damn things. Um, and so we've got a rough idea. Um, Glenn Seaborg, he does a lot of work in secret with, um, with Segre, actually, Emilio Segre. Um, he can only do so much because he's an Italian national, of course, but they start working and, and doing all the calculations and they come up with the, the calculations that says actually plutonium could be fissile and it could, will, because it's a larger atom, give a much bigger boom than uranium. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, you're right. It's, it's, all, it's all theoretical at this point. Okay, thanks. So we finally reach the Manhattan Project uh, in 1942, uh, 13th of August. It is not called the Manhattan Project. It is never called the Manhattan Project, even though everyone knows it as that. Its name is the Development of Substitute Materials. Um, the reason we call it the Manhattan Project is that US engineering works end up uh, under a certain district. And in this particular case, the office was in Manhattan in New York. And so it was the Manhattan District Project. But in 1942, the total funding from until it ends in 1946 is 2 billion US dollars. It is not the most expensive project of the war. It is incredibly expensive. Um, and so you can see how rapidly they've started to scale up as soon as Pearl Harbor happens, as soon as they realize that actually this is completely feasible. Um, and they're going to sell this idea to those, the men with the wallets, the men with the purses, because, you know, we, we know that by December 41, early 42, you know, the, the world is at each other's throats. There are massive great campaigns happening and two billion is a lot of money. And there's lots of very basic tech, landmines, sea mines, lots of just aircraft, more tanks that are very, very simple to produce. And that money goes an extraordinary long way to conventional th things. So who is, uh, if I'm going down a rabbit hole, I, I, I see. No, no, no. It's, it's a good rabbit hole to go down. Who's but funding it? Well, it's, it's coming. No, we're, we're, we're having people saying how good you are at explaining. Someone must be able to go into rooms in, you know, the Senate, Congress, whatever, the White, and sell this idea in an incredibly convincing way to get the state to the departments, all the finance to say, okay, yeah, here's $2 billion going into something that, as we just established, is still really only theoretical. It's not like they've got the, well, here's the baby version that definitely works. This is still... I mean, the promise is huge. That the potential of this clearly is, is as we know from the outcome in uh, 77 years ago today of Nagasaki, is huge. But it, it, there's nothing to back this up except words, really. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And and it's it's a load of it's it's those boffins, it's those brainiacs coming in, those scientists with their ideas. 
Um, and it's always fascinating to me that the scientist who ends up in charge, as I mentioned, multiple Nobel Prize winners were working on this. It's not a Nobel Prize winner who gets appointed in the end. It's, it's Robert Oppenheimer, just a guy at Berkeley. Um, the answer is Vannevar Bush. Uh, Vannevar Bush is the guy who's sort of leading and in, in, in is incredibly capable of explaining this science. Um, Ernest Lawrence, also fantastic uh, at, at explaining things and, and sort of getting people on side and able to massage a team, I think is the best way to describe it. He's able to sort of get everybody on board. But there's also several different generals and, and they actually move around depending on, on where they are um, and not just at general level as well. It's also at colonel level who are incredibly persuasive and actually able to say, look, this is this is serious. Um, but you're absolutely right. It's, it's fascinating that this is a project that gets this amount of money, given it is theoretical. I mean, the but potential is huge, but it, it but it isn't something you can say uh, this is a new bomber design. This is a point here from Pat, who's you know pro, you know, very very aviation based. Imagine if Whittle had two million, let alone two billion, to work with in 1942. How further ahead would we be with jets, for example? Just as a to throw that as an idea. Okay, that's Britain. That's not the USA, but. I mean, again, I don't want to overstate. Two billion is a hell of a lot, and that's two billion then, isn't it? That's not two. This is two billion then, yeah. and and the, cra the the amazing thing is, this isn't the, the end of the spend, as you'll see. Um, this is this is this is just the beginning of it. Um, it's two billion over the course of the whole project. I, I should probably point that out. It's not like in nineteen, you know, thirteenth of August, nineteen forty-two. There is a check signed over. Yeah. Um, gradual costs do increase. But uh, but yeah, and uh, and obviously you need someone in charge. And in the end, it falls down to two men. Uh, the chap on the left there is um, he's, he was known as quite pugnacious, quite sort of aggressive, uh, a bit chubby around the around the, a bit loose around the middle like me. Uh, his name is Leslie Groves, General Leslie Groves, and he is the guy that designed the Pentagon. So he is an engineer, and he's great at pulling things together. And Groves is best um, summed up as an incredible organizer. Uh, one thing that always startles me, the Manhattan Project, when we get to the size of it, um, is that mostly it went very smoothly. You know, there were very few hiccups, and that's largely down to Groves. And one of the reasons that the science went so smoothly is Groves had a brilliant notion to appoint the chap on the right. That is Robert Oppenheimer. And Oppenheimer was this erudite, um, very, very polished, came from a very wealthy family um, scientist, but he wasn't a Nobel Prize winner. But he had the ability to bring people together and to organize. And he had divisions under Compton, he had divisions under Lawrence, um, and, and under Yuri as well, over in um, uh, Princeton, Columbia, uh, just to get everything moving. And they're the guys that organize. And when we look at the scale now, uh, you'll just see what they're organizing. So this is the number of personnel that were involved in the Manhattan Project. The scale there is in thousands. You can see it goes up to about um, 125,000 at its peak. That total, that, that biggest lump, that is all personnel. Uh, the other humps, the second, uh, second largest hump is construction. So the majority of people were working in construction. But 600,000 people um, from the start of the project in 1942 to 1946 uh, is astonishing. That is the population of Glasgow. And bear in mind, this is just the people working on it. This isn't their families and their children who obviously need to live somewhere. Um, 125,310 people was, was the peak number in the middle of 1944. That is equivalent to the number of people who land on the beaches on D-Day. So when we think of the Manhattan Project, it isn't this tiny project. It is the equivalent of another front, essentially. And two billion, it's you know, it's a huge spend. Again, think of it in terms of another front. And it stretches across the continental United States of America. Uh, there are so many different sites that I could pick out. You've got Ames in Iowa, for example, that was doing some secretive stuff. St. Louis is really, really important. Um, um, Alamogordo, which is actually where they test the bomb, that's Project Trinity um, in 1945. I'm just going to pick a couple of the key points and sort of work you through them and give you an idea of how many personnel were working on each. So Chicago, that's the Met Lab, the Metallurgical Laboratory. That is under Compton. And their job is he's brought Seaborg over. Seaborg arrives on his 30th birthday. These are not old scientists. They are young scientists. Their job is how do we isolate plutonium? How do we scale up plutonium production? Because obviously that's going to be an important weapon for the future. We have Oak Ridge. 
Oak Ridge is looking at refining uranium. How can we actually make the uranium bomb work? And that's really the, the, the center of the Manhattan Project. That's, that's home base, if you like. We have Los Alamos, which is where the bomb makers are working. This is, this is where probably most people imagine uh, the Manhattan Project, get their idea of the Manhattan Project, these isolated scientists in the desert. That's Los Alamos. And then finally, uh, just under the T there in the Manhattan Project, right at the top in Washington, we have uh, Richmond. That is the Hanford Engineering Works. And believe me, when you want to look at, appreciate the scale of the Manhattan Project, we'll come on to Hanford. But this is stretching across the United States of America. And I'm going to break down uh, each of the, uh, the areas and explain what they were doing. So let's start with, uh, with the Met Lab in Chicago, the Metallurgical Laboratory. Um, it's still there in the building, um, although other parts of it aren't. They eventually move out to uh, Argonne, National, uh, Argonne Forest, which becomes Argonne National Laboratory uh, and Fermilab, things like that. But their job is how to make and isolate plutonium. 2,044 people working on staff. So this is relatively small for the Manhattan Project. August 1942, they get the first weighable amount of plutonium. They've been creating it in particle accelerators, and their job is how to refine it. And Seaborg is the guy that's sort of running this because he discovered it, and he has a brilliant idea. He's got a friend of his called Stanley Thompson, uh, who he went, to, uh, he went to high school with, he went to UCLA with, and Stanley Thompson was a chemist who had gone off to work for Standard Oil. And he thinks, okay, oil is about refining. Why don't I get Stanley Thompson in? So he calls Stan in, and Stan comes up with this brilliant process called bismuth phosphate process, where they can actually isolate the plutonium. You get other sort of more maverick figures. You get a guy called Al Giorso, who is an electrical engineer. And uh, Glenn Seaborg's wife, who was actually Ernest Lawrence's secretary, um, he, uh, he marries her, um, says, I've got a, a friend of mine. Um, her husband is trying to get into the Navy. Can you write him a, you know, a letter? And Seaborg says, okay. And says, what was that? Oh, uh, something just did something on my computer. Nothing. Don't okay, mind. <laughs> never mind. I thought we were suddenly uh, crashing. Um, so yeah. So Helen Seaborg uh, asks Glenn to write a letter, and Glenn says, actually, let's use this guy. You know, he's got skills that I need. And Albert Giorso turns out to be absolutely fantastic at making elements. He goes on to become the, the most successful element discoverer of all time. 12 elements um, by the end of, it, of everything, including two during the Manhattan Project. Um, but that's not that's a side project they were doing by the end of it. Um, the big problem they've got is how they, they can scale up plutonium, as I mentioned. Problem is you're, you've only got a tiny weighable amount in August 1942. How do you get more of it? And this is when Enrico Fermi re-enters the picture. So he fled Italy. He ended up in, in the United States. And he comes up with this idea. Why don't we get a, a block that is basically a neutron bouncy castle? Neutrons are flying around everywhere. And then we'll feed uranium rods into it. And sure, most of them will blow up. Most of them will produce energy. But we'll still get quite a lot of plutonium that we can capture. What he was talking about was, of course, the first nuclear reactor. And they build it in Chicago um, underneath the bleachers of Stag Field, which was the sports stadium. They build it in a, in a, a rackets court, a kind of squash court. And there it is. That is the world's first nuclear reactor. Of course, downtown Chicago is not a great place for a nuclear reactor. Uh, so they then build one over in the forests. And this proves that you can actually use a nuclear reactor to upscale your uranium and start making plutonium. And that's what the first nuclear reactors are for. It's not to produce energy, it is to upscale and produce plutonium. So that's what they're doing at MetLab. Let's move on to Oak Ridge. So Oak Ridge is a fascinating uh, secret city, and as you can see, 75,000 staff. This is a city. Uh, their focus predominantly is how to make uranium. Um, not make uranium, I should clarify, how to refine uranium to get the right isotope. That's what you want to make. So on 19th of September, 1942, the US Army takes over 59,000 acres near Knoxville, Tennessee. The reason they choose Knoxville, Tennessee is one, it's got Knoxville nearby, you've got a population center. Several dams were built uh, during the 1930s as part of the, the New Deal. Um, so there's a lot of energy there and you're going to need that. Uh, and also you've got fantastic transport links because Tennessee's got lots of railways, it's got lots of roads, it's the perfect place. And they take over this land, they kick out the people living there, 
It's in several valleys. That's deliberate so that if one part of it blows up, it won't blow up the other parts because they're all in different valleys. And they create a city in which no one goes in and no one goes out without authorization. It becomes known as the secret city. Um, and their job is different ways to create uh, and refine uranium because they don't know what the right way is. By the end of the war, Oak Ridge, originally it was called the Clinton Engineering Works, um, has become the fifth largest city in Tennessee. And they've called it Oak Ridge because it sounds innocuous. It sounds like some nice place on a map that has nothing to do with making weapons. Now, if we go into the, uh, the different parts of, uh, of Oak Ridge, and it's important to remember when it first began, uh, there were no nice roads or anything like that. This is, this is a mud, muddy camp, essentially, with 75,000 people. Dysentery was rife um, in the whole camp. It's not a nice place to live. Down by, the, uh, by the, 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 uh, the river, you've got the K25 gaseous diffusion plant. They're trying to use gaseous diffusion to, to, to refine their uranium. This becomes the largest building in the world. It is absolutely massive. That is not even the biggest project. The biggest project is Y12, and that is the electromagnetic plant. 22,000 staff there, predominantly women, uh, working there 24 hours a day. Now, what they're doing is uh, that, that circular thing on the left is called a calutron, and they've set it up in a racetrack configuration, and they are using electromagnetic processes to try and refine their uranium. Y12 still exists to this day. That's still where they make nuclear weapons. Now, because copper is incredibly sh short supply in the United States of America at this time, and the rest of the world, because it's a war material, you need copper for many, many different aspects of your war project, they decide that they need something else that's, um, that's electromagnetic you know, conductivity. And they get 14,700 tons of silver from the US reserve. That is 300 million tons of silver from West Point. They're actually able to keep that and, and send it back. And I think they lose 0.003% of it or something like that, a tiny, tiny fraction. They're able to give the US reserve back its silver at the end of the Manhattan Project. But when you want to talk about spare cash lying around, 14,700 tons of silver in a valley that's secretive in Tennessee. How about that? Wow. I mean, it's people are saying in the sidebar, this is just true. The, the figures, the size, the complexity, the detail, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing. It, it absolutely is. And the other thing they build at Oak Ridge, uh, which wasn't initially part of its plan, is X10. And this is the world's first permanent nuclear reactor. Um, and so you see those little holes there. Uh, basically, you've, uh, you've got your neutron bouncy castle behind that wall. And in those holes, you feed in long rods of uranium. That's what those, those mannequins are doing. X10 still exists to this day. I've actually been in there. It's incredibly secretive. You're not allowed to take photos around it. The US government really don't like it. Um, Department of Energy won't let you do that. But this is uh, Enrico Fermi's baby. And this is a permanent nuclear reactor to make sure that we can use a permanent nuclear reactor to produce plutonium. That is the sole purpose of it. But of course, that particular baby nuclear reactor, it might be the world's first permanent one, it's not big enough to produce plutonium in the quantities they need. Because by now they've realized that actually making a bomb from uranium is a pain in the butt. The best way to do it is plutonium. Plutonium not only is easier, but also it's a far more powerful bomb. And so you do get the little boy bombs. The first bomb, of course, dropped on Hiroshima. That's uranium. It's a very, very simple bomb. They know it's going to work. But they decide that really plutonium is the way forward. And if they're going to have bombs after the war, they want them to be plutonium bombs. So they need somewhere where they can build nuclear reactors, huge, giant nuclear reactors, just to produce and farm plutonium. And the answer is Washington State and the Hanford site. 51,000 staff working on it. The focus is, make, is, is making plutonium. And you don't really get the scale of it from that map. Uh, you see Washington State there, that, that sort, of, um, uh, sort of duck egg blue. That is the Hanford site. 586 square miles are cleared of all residences, all people living there, and taken over by the United States government DuPont are the main contractors for this. This is in January 1943. 
to give you a, a rough idea of how big that is, if you're a European, that is the size of Greater London. That's everywhere inside the M25. Wow. If you are an American, that is half the size of Rhode Island. We're talking a vast, vast territory, about the size of uh, New York City, um, the whole New York City, and a little bit of, uh, of Newark as well. And the Hanford site is where they basically make plutonium for the next 40 years, it's next Cold War. It becomes the most polluted site in the world. It's still incredibly radio radioactive. It will take billions to clean it up. But the Hanford site is where they're mass producing it. And they're mainly making it in the Second World War in B reactor. That is the size of B reactor. And if you compare that to what you just saw with X10 and the baby one uh, a little bit earlier, you get to see the sheer size of it. It's massive. And that's what they're using to produce the plutonium. So what you can kind of see where the money is going. You can see why <laughs> some of these these bills that are being submitted are kind of yeah yeah. There's a couple of extra noughts you perhaps weren't expecting there because of just you know this is this is a kind of a money pit, isn't it? Everything we're looking at is just is. how many miles do you want there, son? Yeah, five hundred and sixty-four square miles. It's it's, it's and, huge. And that's that's again that's one of those points where we where we talk about sort of could Germany have made a nuclear weapon and the idea that actually their money's going everywhere. One, they don't have the money for it. They don't have that quantity of silver. They just don't have it. They don't have the personnel to actually work on the project, and they do not have a space the size of Greater London that they can hide. You yeah. know, bombers could come over and bomb them. So there is absolutely no way the Germans could have possibly made a nuclear weapon um, during the Second World War. They just and couldn't that's, have done it. That's worth underlying that point there because that comes up quite often, isn't it? The German, someone was, in fact, it was a couple of shows ago, someone was adamant that the Germans were close to nuclear weapons and, and people were saying, no, they weren't. They, they were possibly close to the theory. They were, they were, they were, they were maybe could have got the, the proof it works on paper. But as you've been explaining, there's no way they could get the infrastructure to get anywhere near where the USA is. That's it. It's infrastructure. So they were actually, they went up the garden path a little bit because the guy leading it, Heisenberg, took them down this heavy water route that wasn't the right one. But as you see, the Americans tried different routes themselves. The key thing, though, is infrastructure. When the source mission, um, which is the, the mission that goes in to look at nuclear projects, and in fact, that really annoyed sort of nuclear secrecy people because um, Olsos in, in Greek is Grove. Um, and of course, Leslie Groves was in charge of the Manhattan Project. When Groves heard about that, he was furious. Um, wasn't the only security upset they had in, in um, the mid 1940s. They had uh, a Superman comic strip that was talking about particle accelerators and bombarding Superman. That was, you know, DC Comics got raided by the FBI going, why the hell are you talking about that? Change the comic strip immediately. We can't have you discussing this. Um, there were quite a few sort of little incidents like that. But yeah, it's it's about space. It's about the infrastructure. And the Germans just didn't have it. And they couldn't have had it because they would have been bombed to hell. Whereas, of course, in the United States of America, you can take over somewhere the size of you know half of Rhode Island. And no one's going to notice because it's in Washington. We've got a question from Woody Lee um, that that is about the health hazards. Now, of those various sites you've been explaining, mm. obviously some of them have higher health risks and others have lower ones. But at any point during this process, is there much thought being done about the safety of workers? Now, I know that's a very large, encompassing question. There's people it doing is. lots of It's a really good question as well, um, because the answer is yes. So right. when we think about the, you know, Often when we think about radioactivity, we talk about radium and famously the radium girls were licking their pencils and things like that. That is not happening in the Manhattan Project. Uh, we've got stills from um, Life magazine in the 1940s, uh, 1946. They actually go into the Met Lab and they have a look at the, the precautions that they're using. So they are using lead lined uh, sort of bibs. They are using lead bricks. That's still what you do today. And in fact, some of the lab accidents that happen um, there is a case where someone is carrying a vial of, of uranium, um, not uranium, plutonium, and he, he, he holds it too tight and the glass breaks and it shatters into his hands. And they have to gather up the individual beads of plutonium from his hands, and he isn't allowed to eat for a month using his hands. He has to use a straw, get someone to help him. 
So they absolutely take it seriously. Hanford is probably the, the, the one exception to that. A lot of people that work at Hanford, including Stanley Thompson, he dies in the 1970s after moving to Hanford, um, have uh, cancer-related issues. But they are taking safety very, very seriously in most cases. Um, there is one person who doesn't, a guy called Lewis Slotin. Uh, he's actually making the bomb. He's a Canadian scientist. And his party trick is to try and lower the two halves of the, uh, if, it, if the two halves combine, you get the, um, the chain reaction. And he tries to lower it with a screwdriver to see how low he can get. And one day the screwdriver slips and uh, there's a flash and uh, the air ionizes around him and he dies in horrible agony nine days later. It's, it's an incident known as the demon core incident. So there are safety accidents that happen, but they are very few and far between because safety has been considered paramount. And at Oak Ridge, one of the first buildings they have is, is a biology uh, lab, which is looking at the impact of radioactivity. So if we move on to Los Alamos, which is what everyone thinks of as the bomb, I haven't got a very good photo of Los Alamos. Um, so th that is actually a photo of the Trinity test, but it, it is the bomb. That is the, uh, the science package of a plutonium bomb. Uh, the fat man shape is because it has to implode. Pig staff at Los Alamos, 3,248. So this is much smaller than Oak Ridge or Hanford. And their focus is weapon design. And again, this is what people typically think of when they think of the Manhattan Project. They take over the Los Alamos Ranch School. It's just outside um, Santa Fe in New Mexico. And you have all kinds of people working there who are from scientists. You have US, you have British. James Chadwick comes over to lead the British mission. I mentioned Louis Sloten, Canadian. You have German scientists. Um, you've got Hans Beth, for example. Um, Italian scientists, as I mentioned, um, Fermi and several other uh, scientists moved over. Hungarian, Edward Teller is probably the most famous of those, but the, the Martians of science. So this is an incredibly um, multi, multilingual, multinational um, collaboration of scientists. And I've got some photos of the Manhattan Project just to kind of give you an idea of, of who's working on there. Um, so I mentioned Edward Teller. Uh, that's him in the 1950s. He was much younger at the time. He becomes the chief bomb maker of the United States. Um, he's a big fan of, uh, of, of nuclear bombs. He take, takes over an area which is known as uh, Lawrence Livermore now, the National Laboratory, and starts making thermonuclear weapons. The hydrogen bomb is him. In the middle, we've got um, uh, William Knox, and he is the only black supervisor in the Manhattan Project. He's working at Columbia University. So uh, Harvard graduate, PhD, doctor in chemistry. Um, there are a lot of, um, of uh, African-Americans who work on the Manhattan Project, uh, but only one of them was a supervisor. And then we have Madame Wu uh, from China, um, Ching, Shu, uh, Ching Shun Wu. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing her name. Um, she was a fantastic physicist at Berkeley. Later on, she would go on to conduct what's called the Wu experiment, um, and despite it being called the Wu experiment, her two collaborators won the Nobel Prize and she didn't. Um, but uh, it, I mean, that's just unfortunately the, the situation with sexism in, uh, in Nobel Prizes, which is a, another subject entirely. But my point is that you have multiple nations, multiple races uh, all working on this project. It's huge. And they are not old people at all. Here are three people who worked on the Manhattan Project. Um, on the right there, we have uh, Richard Feynman. Uh, he was in his mid-20s at the time, goes on to become uh, an incredibly famous scientist, a very good science communicator. He's the guy that explains why the Challenger blows up in the 1980s. He's also the only person that we know who has witnessed a nuclear bomb uh, with, uh, with unshielded eyes. So at the Trinity test, he works out that the light refraction would be fine if he sits inside of a truck uh, and the windscreen will protect him. And so he's the only person who watches the Trinity test without goggles. Um, in the middle, we have uh, Lily Hornig. Uh, she was a Czech scientist who moved over, again, Jewish family, fleeing persecution in Europe. She moves over. She starts working on the Manhattan Project. Her husband is actually the guy that babysits the bomb the night before it's tested. And finally, we have uh, Klaus Fuchs, who is a spy. Uh, he came over the British side of the project, and he is the guy that leaks it all to the Russians. But he's in his early 30s. Linny Hornig, early 20s, Richard Feynman, mid-20s. 
These are not old scientists. This isn't the sort of, you know, the stuffy gray people with pipes and white kind of stuff that you have an image of. It's young, bright minds. Now, finally, as I, I'm just going to wrap up very quickly because we're running out of time, I know. Um, we get two bombs. Uh, little boy bomb is the uranium bomb. That's almost obsolete as it's made, but we know it's going to work. So that is taken off to the USS Indianapolis and loaded on in San Francisco. And we've got the plutonium bomb. We're not sure if that's going to go. We need to test it. And so they do it uh, at the Trinity site in New Mexico. Trinity test, 16th of July, 1945. Um, that tiny box that... Uh, the chaps bring in, his name's Herbert Lear, um, that holds the, the plutonium core, the actual part of the bomb that works. Everything else, that giant package is just to basically implode it. And the core is about the size of a small bowling ball, a over large tennis ball. It weighs about a stone. It's not very big at all. Initially, the plan is to blow it up in this giant tank, uh, which is called Jumbo. Um, the idea was to contain the blast so you can analyze it. But of course, the scientists pointed out to, to Groves that despite spending a lot of money on making this giant metal container, what you're doing is the bomb is going to be so powerful, you are creating a giant shrapnel grenade. This is not a good thing to do, a nuclear shrapnel grenade. Uh, Jumbo is still in the desert. You're allowed to visit the Trinity site uh, in October or April. Uh, one day, there's two days a year um, that, that you can actually visit. I've been there. And Jumbo is still there when you walk up to the Trinity site. They just left it in the uh, in the rusting in the desert. So Trinity test, 16th of July, 1945. They do it with an airburst. They drop it from this tower. Uh, it explodes. The first person to speak isn't Oppenheimer with his Bhagavad Gita, which he just thought, um, if you listen to what he says. The first person to speak is Kenneth Bainbridge, uh, who was in charge of the test. It was his job that if the bomb didn't go off, to go up to that tower knock on the bomb and see what was wrong with it. And his reaction to the bomb going off was, now we're all sons of bitches, which I think is a much better line and much pithier than uh, than the erudite uh, Oppenheimer. Yeah. But the Trinity test goes off, and, uh, and there we have it. That is the first explosion of a nuclear bomb, 16th of July, 1945, 5.29 a.m., uh, done in New Mexico. You can see there on the right, uh, that's the, uh, the crater in the blast site. And I bring your attention down to the, uh, the bottom right there, the um, 0.1 kiloton test crater. They set off 100 tons of explosives so they could actually have a comparison. 100 tons of explosives does that tiny black dot, and nuclear bomb does that. It's around uh, 12 kilotons, the Trinity test, 12 to 14 kilotons. Incredibly powerful, so powerful that a, a blind girl driving 50 miles away, being driven, sorry, uh, 50 miles away to school, says, what the hell was that? Turns to the driver. Uh, there is a flash, a plane going over Albuquerque, sort of almost blinded by it. The pilots, they're told, do not fly south or any, any circumstances. It shatters windows 100 miles away. They have to come up with a cover story that an ammo dump has blown up. And while this is happening, because they know the uranium bomb is going to work, it is already on the Indianapolis, and the Indianapolis is given orders to set sail to Tinian Island, where, of course, the bomb will eventually be delivered. Uh, to Hiroshima. So that is the Manhattan Project, and I apologize for sort of running out of time, but I hope that's given you an idea of the sheer scale of the project. It is absolutely, yeah, absolutely. absolutely been incredible, and we do, we'll do some questions, and I've got some questions. So the first one, Brad, from On This Day in Canadian Military History, is it true that Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer cheered the bomb working? No, it's not. So Oppenheimer was actually asked his reaction, uh, and he said, a couple of people cheered, um, a couple of people cried, most were silent. I remembered the poem of the Bhagavad Gita, uh, and then he quotes uh, the whole thing, but the important line is, now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. So Oppenheimer was one of the people who was quiet when the bomb went off and and, and kind of um, very contemplative. Thank you. And George Newman is saying, how did Fat Man get to Tinian? Fat Man got to Tinian by plane. Um, so they, they transported, there is a, a famous case where the guy guarding it, um, someone comes up to him on the on the runway, this this sort of imperious colonel going, hey there, I don't have the authorization for this. Uh, I want to have a look inside. And he has a gun pointed at him saying, sir, I am not allowed to do that. Um, it's really kind of interesting, actually, when they were transporting the, the, uh, the, the, the fat man bombs, uh, they couldn't hold them properly in the, um, in the B-29s. Um, and so they had to use something called Marmon clamps. 
which is this new type of clamp so they could actually hold the bomb in place uh, before they drop it. And the Marmon camps were built by, I've got to get this right, it's Zeppo Marx. So one of the Marx brothers, um, he didn't like Hollywood. He didn't enjoy acting in Hollywood. He went into, uh, into production of, um, of clamps and it's his clamps that hold the, uh, the nuclear bombs in place. So the Marx brothers had a part in the Manhattan Project, um, albeit indirectly. Okay, well, we've got two people, thank you for that, who've asked um, how many bombs could the US have produced in 1945 and how many did they? I don't have the exact number, but they were mass producing the bomb, the plutonium at, at Hanford at that site uh, already. So they had multiple cores ready to go. They had some bombs already lined up. And in fact, as I mentioned, this demon core, they're actually, they've got cores that they can experiment on. So um, I can't I'll give you the exact figure. I apologize. The guy who would know is um, uh, Alex Wellerstein, who is a fantastic writer. He writes on nuclear secrecy, um, and he would have that answer. I, I'm sorry, I don't. No but they, they had several plutonium bombs ready to go. Um, so going back to the, all those the, all those multitude of sites, in fact, in fact, if you can bring the map up, that would be really cool. Yeah, because, sure. Was... Because, you know, the, the Trinity test was July. If I'm remembering correctly from being in the presentation, the plan was to get this by January 1945. January 1945, yeah. So was it behind or was it only July they got to the point? I mean, in January, where were they? In January, where were they? They were, they were, they were behind. But, I mean, of course, you're projecting in 1941 where you're going to be. The fact yeah. that you are, you know, four or five months out, I think is perfectly reasonable. Um, but what they were is is more forward than they thought they were going to be in plutonium. Because on that day, uh, on that meeting on the 6th of December, famously the quote from Conant is, uh, Glenn Seaborg is a very good scientist, but he isn't that good uh, when it came to producing large quantities of plutonium. And Conant was right, but ultimately they got over that project, the problem. And so there was a slightly shifting goalpost because you're talking about production of uranium and then suddenly you move to plutonium as your, as your primary use. Um, so, yes, they were technically, I suppose, a little bit late uh, in their predictions. But, of course, they produced a much more powerful weapon as well. Yeah. So which will lead me to my next question, because when we think about some of the tech in World War II, I'm thinking about the various problems the Allies were having with torpedoes, the Germans were having with torpedoes. There's other bits of tech that... That the people looking at, at in kind of one place and they're still struggling because it seems to me that this is a this is a the, the typical metaphor of a, of a chain only being as strong as the weakest link. Is any one of these plants that are working or whatever aspect they're working, whether it's plutonium, whether it's the structure of the bomb, it's the casings, whether it's on the delivery, all these things there. If one gets critically behind, then surely the whole project is only going to be moving at the speed of that of that least successful program. And, and, that, and that happens. So we actually see scientists being sent over to, they don't just stay in one place. You know, Seaborg moves over to Oak Ridge and Fermi moves around. Um, they move where they're needed. And if one part is falling behind, then they jump on that to try and solve the problem and try and fix it and get everything running smoothly. And, you know, Feynman, as I said, he was a very junior scientist, but he was sent around to try and solve problems as well. So... There is a lot of movement of the key players, the key this, sort of these minds. But um, when we talk about sort of getting things working, bear in mind Los Alamos and the bomb actually working project. We're talking two years and 3,000 of the, well, the majority of them were actually guards, but, you know, a couple of hundred of the world's greatest scientists uh, trying to crack this problem um, and being willing to support each other. And again, that's a key part of Robert Oppenheimer because it wasn't about ego with him. He was about solving the problem and being able just to cut through the, the guff and focus on the issue. So rather than ending up going up the garden path like the Germans do with Heisenberg, they are able to just to get someone who sees the bigger picture and is able to keep the project moving forward. Okay, thank you. We've got one question from Marks and Sparks who is asking, how much involvement did Sir William Penny, father of the British A-bomb in the 50s, have in the actual bomb development as part of the project? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know. Is is uh, I, I can't answer the question. Okay, that's a fair good answer. To this now, my next question is about because because we said at the beginning we're not going to go down the rabbit hole of the morality question and the who used it and how they used it. But taking forgetting that for a moment, it is as as a pure scientist, is some of the just the the brilliance of of the work behind this somewhat overshadowed by the destructive nature of it you know this these you know the list of names you mentioned these these nobel 
uh, prize winners all coming together from numerous countries, mm -hmm. some of whom are Axis countries. The, the pure science behind this is brilliant, whether or not you can have you can you can admire the pure science and also be abhorrent, abhorrent at the use of the weapon. So, but has some of that scientific appreciation been lost in the moral question of its use? I think it absolutely has. And I think the, the interesting thing about the Manhattan Project is, is the scale of scientists coming together and working. The really interesting thing is that this is right at the start when scientists start thinking about, all right, you do this bit, you become the expert in this, I'll do the expert in this. Previously, someone like Marie Curie would have to do everything herself. That's only the previous generation. And it, again, it's Ernest Lawrence who comes up with this concept of big science, you know, we all specialize in one area and we work together as a team. So this is the first true global science project. It is the first one that happens. And I think, to, I mean, from, from my perspective, the only project that's sort of equivalent, you know, we're not even talking things like CERN and the Hadron Collider. The only thing that I would say is comparative to the Manhattan Project is how rapidly the COVID vaccines were developed. Yeah. That is the only project we've ever had on this scale where everyone was just all on the same page. Well, I was going to make the point. It's interesting you said COVID because I was going to go with solution to global warming. I was going to go, you know, if, if oh, I, I, mean, I, I would know. love if that was the case. I would it's love if we were work, all working on I think oh, the, stop pretending it's just weather. I'm I'm completely convinced by the science myself. Global warming is a thing. We are destroying our planet. And and, and it shows you this this what what can be put to a solution in in war is this monumental advance, uh, advance in science that they're thrusting two billion at and devoting all these sites to, and they get where they're supposed to be two years later, okay, a few months behind. And in this era of 2022, if, if the equivalent scientists of all these nations were thrust and brought together and our governments threw at them the money we were talking about then, we kind of get global warming cracked in two years maybe. I, mean, I, I think probably two years would be uh, a little bit sort of optimistic. Yeah, yeah, I you know what I mean. It's just... I, I, I mean, I, I completely agree with you in the, in the if, if we all came together and we started to, and, and we had the money and the infrastructure, that's the key thing. It's not the ideas. You know, it's, as I said, everyone knew about nuclear, nuclear fusion and nuclear fission. This was not a secret. It was only the United States with its infrastructure and its ability to just throw money at the problem and throw infrastructure at the problem that allowed them to be first with nuclear weapons. If we did that with uh, with global warming on a global scale, absolutely we could find solutions. Um, but yeah. there has to be a political will to do it, and right now, unfortunately, there isn't. No, uh, but and that's a discussion. People say, "Oh, they're going down that woke thing there," but I, I, I don't do it very often on the channel. But I thought it was worth doing. So finally, my last takeaways are: is is there, you know, we, we talked about this film. What what are your hopes for the the this Killian Murphy film? Are you are you, are you do you? I, I'll just, I, what are your hopes for it? I mean, my hopes were that it represents the science in an interesting way. I mean, I've had a look at the cast and who's uh, playing sort of, I mean, Groves is being played and, and you've got a star studded cast. You've got Matt Damon in there, Robert Downey Jr., things like that. So I think that we are going to get some of the Manhattan Project and some of the science. Um, my worry is that it's predominantly going to focus on uh, the communism side of, of what happened with Oppenheimer in that he was basically after the war, uh, he was called a communist. He was hounded. Um, certainly he did have ties and certainly particularly his wife. Uh, sorry, not wife, um, uh, the, the lady here I was having uh, liaisons with um, had links uh, with the with the, um, with the Communist Party. But um, my hope is that it doesn't show the idea of, you know, as we mentioned earlier, sort of Benedict Cumberbatch, that one man band sort of slaving away on his machine and everyone going, what are you doing? You know, oh, I'm just in the garden shed making some tweaks to this, you know, world saving computer that we do show that it is a factory, that this wasn't some sort of tiny shed where there was a couple of people gathered around a table going, let's make a bomb. This was a huge undertaking. Yeah, and, and trivialized with love affairs of people sweeping plans off tables to have have nookie on the table there. Well, that, in, in, in fairness, I mean, that, that kind of stuff did, I mean, Richard Feynman, for example, was famous for breaking into safes and stealing codes and, and writing little notes saying, ha ha, we have all your secrets signed the Nazis. And leaving it into his mates. So, I mean, wacky stuff did happen on the on the Manhattan Project, but um, 
who knows? Who knows what we're going to get? Yeah. And, and I think it, it kind of connects with the earlier show is that, that what happened beyond the moral questions, the fact that the Russians get involved in Cold War and secrecy and the fact we live in the nuclear age, all that is beyond what was being thought of by these people who were genuinely interested, it seems to me, in the pure science and the aspect of getting a weapon so that the Axis don't get the weapon to, to bring an end to the war. And all the other layers of complication have happened since are kind of post facto um, the discussion we are left with now that we are living in a world with 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 nuclear weapons and the questions people someone's starting what might happen in in Ukraine and what happens if nuclear plants and Chernobyl I mean with that rabbit hole rabbit hole rabbit hole we're not going to go down these down but we'll, we'll I think we'll bring things to an end so Kit um, as usual you've knocked it out of the park we will bring you back on again for some another another aspect of World War II science for you to detangle and uh uh, the Dr. Kit Chapman way, because you make it easy to understand what is essentially a very, very complicated subject. So thank you for that. So people have people have loved it. So there we are. So I'm going to take you off screen in mind people we're coming up tomorrow. I'll come back and bring in a minute. So tomorrow, don't forget, folks, our show tomorrow is two hours later. It's 9 p.m. UK time. Henry Sledge and Damon Stout are coming on to talk about the Peleliu VMF 114 squadrons taken off in support. These marine pilots supporting the ground campaign. So it's all about air and ground cooperation. I've seen the slides. I've seen the photos. I've seen some of the stuff there. That is going to be an outstanding presentation. Damon is working on a documentary about this, this unit. And Henry will be given the point of view of his father, the famous um, Eugene Sledge, who was on the ground receiving the benefits of this incredible air coordination uh, behind the scenes there, this air support that was invaluable to the Pacific campaign. Thursday, we got Russell Lowe on talking about a B-24 that came down in uh, New Guinea. Yeah, and then on Friday, I haven't put the schedule uh, show up yet, an extra show for you about some uh, allied uh, prisoners of war who were affected by the Nagasaki blast. So we still haven't quite left the subject of atomic bombs that's coming up on Friday, but I haven't got the show listed. And I'll do that as soon as I can. So I'm going to bring Kit back on just to say goodbye, really. So there we are, Kit. Um, fantastic. Knocked you out of the park. I can't wait to bring it, have an excuse to bring you back again. So, um, brilliant. Thanks for having me. So, there we are. This is Paul Woodadge and Kit Chapman for World War II TV saying, I'll see you all again tomorrow, but don't forget two hours later, folks. So, cheers. Have a good evening. Thanks for being with us and thanks for your fantastic conversations in the sidebar. Cheers, everybody. Bye. <laughs>